of the holy blessed martyr Thomas Beckett. As far as church politics were concerned, what gave it pride of place was the fact its archbishop was head of the English church. The reason for this was historical. It was here that St. Augustine had founded his church. Sent by Gregory the Great in 597 to bring Christianity to the Anglo-Saxons, his church became the natural center of ecclesiastical affairs in the country and has remained so until this day. The cathedral we see was built mainly from the offerings of pilgrims to the shrine of a man who had held the same two positions that Thomas Arundel now held, Chancellor and Archbishop of Canterbury. In fact, it was just because he had made such a fine Chancellor, so jealous in guarding the rights of the King, that Henry II made him Archbishop of Canterbury. To his consternation, he found he had a poacher turned gamekeeper on his hands and that Becket was now only interested in promoting the claims of the papacy and church, particularly with regard to the rights of ecclesiastical courts. The church claimed that only she had the right to try clergy and their trials in their courts were usually much more gentle with their own than were the king's courts. This was known as benefit of clergy and spread beyond ordained clergymen effectively to all who could read and write, at least in theory. A short-tempered Henry by 1179 was so exasperated with the truculence of his erstwhile ally that he prayed out loud, Will someone rid me of this turbulent priest? Taking him at his word, four knights made their way to Canterbury, catching Becket on his way to Vespers with one blow cutting off the crown of his head. Arundel had now been appointed to the See of Canterbury. It's likely that Richard gave his approval with considerable speed, thereby removing him from the position of Chancellor and close involvement with the King. Richard's power was in the Ascendant. And when the Commons in 1397 sponsored a bill which included a complaint of the extravagance of the royal household, they were forced to abjectly withdraw it. The King intended to rule unhindered. We are now at the time of his reign where it used to be argued that Richard was seeking to use tyrannical powers with no constitutional foundation. However, more recently, political analysis has suggested that this attempt to centralise power in one man, the king, should not necessarily be seen as tyranny. It became tyranny if the ruler used this power only for his own selfish purposes. However, if it were intended to be used for the good of all, that crystallising of power in the throne provided the ideal government. That is what Richard intended to do. In 1397, his unruly subjects were invited to a banquet. Gloucester pleaded ill health, and the Earl of Arundel locked himself in his castle at Rygate. Warwick accepted, and at the end of the festivities was conducted to the tower. Gloucester was arrested and told in response to his pleas he'd be shown the same mercy that he'd shown Sir Simon Burley, the King's tutor, and Chaucer's fellow envoy. Archbishop Arundel was persuaded to press his brother to come out from shelter under a promise of safe conduct. When he did so, he promptly seized an act of treachery Thomas Arundel would never forgive. Since Westminster Hall was in the process of being refurbished, a temporary building was constructed in the palace yard, dominated by a raised throne. It was made clear that the assembly had been called to issue judgment in the events of 1387. Duke of Lancaster presided. The first to be dealt with was Archbishop Arundel, who was in attendance as a spiritual lord, not a prisoner. Due to his ecclesiastical status, he escaped with a judgment of forfeiture of his temporalities and perpetual banishment. His brother, the Earl, was next, who pleaded he had been included in the general pardon, but Lancaster dismissed this, saying the pardons had been given under constraint. He was judged and led immediately to Tower Hill and beheaded.
John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, would have been next called to pronounce judgment on his own brother, the Duke of Gloucester, who had been sent to Calais overtly for safekeeping. He was spared the deed when Gloucester's jailer appeared to proclaim him dead already. Nevertheless, his lands were forfeited. Finally, Richard is in control. As he writes to the king, to the king of Byzantium, the emperor of Byzantium, he writes, I found these men who have been trying to take power away from me, have been trying to destroy my reign. Um, I finally got power myself. I can now rule in my own right. This was not a simple act of revenge by the king, but seen as necessary for the security of his realm. John of Gaunt had no grievances against the accused, but must have judged it necessary that they be disposed of. He brought with him his son, Henry Bolingbroke, who was granted the dukedom of Hereford, and Thomas Mowbray, who became Duke of York, amongst other prominent peers of equal weight. But it would be a quarrel between these two that would lead to the unravelling of Richard's attempt to consolidate power in the throne and lead to his death, and ultimately to civil war. He didn't actually manage to gain control until 1397. So that's, he's been in power then for 20 years. Um, but, it, but he hasn't been able to actually gain, take power himself. And uh, it's from that moment that people accuse him of being a tyrant. I don't think we know what, he only had two years acting uh, as, as, as ruler. Um, we don't know what kind of a king he would have been like, I don't think. Supporters of the Lord's Appellant spread rumours the King no longer dared sleep without a guard of 300 Cheshire archers and that his rest was haunted by the ghost of Arendell. What is apparent is that Richard felt uncomfortable calling the next Parliament in London and it was held in Shrewsbury near Cheshire where Thomas Mowbray, the newly created Duke of Norfolk, failed to appear. Henry Bolingbroke, Gaunt's son, claimed that Mowbray's absence was due to a guilty conscience he stated Norfolk had suggested that, since he and Bolingbroke had formed part of the Lord's Appellant before joining the King's party, their lives would be next to be sacrificed, and they should make preparations accordingly. On Mowbray's denial, it was decided the matter be put to trial in the field of arms. There's a quarrel spread. About a year later, after uh, Arundel's uh, uh, exile, um, a quarrel springs up between um, uh, Henry, uh, who's going to be Henry IV, Henry Hereford, and the Duke of Norfolk, and they accuse each other of treason. And there's um, a, a duel. Eventually, they get to a judicial duel. It's announced for 16th of September <coughs> in Coventry, be there or be square. So everybody goes to this uh, duel and they, they, all on, they get on their horses and they actually st apparently start, almost start charging at each other. And then Hen uh, Richard suddenly stops the tournament and says, no, I don't want to have, have any bloodshed. And he exiles Norfolk. And then he, and whoa, great, great, great surprise, surprise. And then he exiles Henry as well. It was a good way of eliminating two unruly subjects. A victory for either might bring trouble in its wake. Within six months, Chaucer would lose his powerful patron, the man who may have helped mould his career, and latterly his brother-in-law. John of Gaunt was dead, and Richard cancelled the letters of attorney that would have allowed his son Henry Bolingbroke of Hereford to come to his inheritance while in exile. The lands were not seized by the king, they'd be restored when Henry or his heir would sue for them from the king's hands. However, since Henry was in exile, it may have seemed that this was little different from disinheriting him. The king's action was to have grievous repercussions. So Henry is, is sent into exile, but on very good terms. He's got £2,000 a year, uh, which is millions of pounds really then. Um, and uh, everybody says, well, he can have a very nice time. He can go on crusades and all the ladies love him. He'll have a great time. Uh, he's got nothing to worry about. and He's not interested in politics anyway. Um, but one of the terms of uh, his exile um, is that he mustn't come back to England, of course. Um, and the other thing is that he mustn't, on no account, must he communicate with uh, or, or, or see or speak to ex-Archbishop uh, Thomas Arundel. Uh, and of course, that's also part of Arundel's terms of uh, exile, that he mustn't communicate with anybody else. <laughs> 
And of course, uh, Henry uh, Arundel is has got nothing. He can't get a job anyway. He's gone to the Pope. The Pope won't help him. Um, he's got no money from being the most powerful man in England for 10 years or more. Um, he's on his uppers. He's got no income. Uh, he's desperate. His only chance is to get back into power. So he comes to Paris and meets up with Henry, of course. And he, I'm sure it's him who persuades Henry to go for the throne and says, look, this is your chance. You, it, you, it'll never come again. And um, so I think that I think I'm sure it's 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 Arundel who pushes Henry to go for the throne and makes sure that Henry s succeeds. Um, there's one uh, uh, chronicle uh, which uh, which is a very it's a, an eyewitness chronicle which says that Arundel actually preaches a, a crusade and says that the Pope has a, has a, has a blessed a crusade against Richard II. Of course, it's absolute nonsense, um, but. If he did do that, and I'm sure he did, I'm sure that's what he did, that accounts partly for how he managed to recruit so many uh, people against Richard so quickly. It was at this time Henry Bolingbroke met another exile in Paris, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Arundel. Plans were laid for an invasion of England, plans in which Arundel stood to gain more than Henry. Henry, at least, had the theoretic means of recovering his position. What is more, his life in exile was not that of a beggar. The queens of Castile and Portugal were his sisters, should he choose to visit them, and he continued to receive an income of £2,000 a year. Life was much less comfortable for the dispossessed archbishop and former chancellor. Although he would never starve, his days of glory seemed to be over. Perhaps Henry would be the card to improve the odds. With Richard in Ireland, Henry landed in the north of England, where, due to his family connections, he was sure of a warm welcome. By the time Richard landed in Wales, close to his loyal county of Cheshire, Henry was already there. This time it was Richard who would be lured out from his refuge, Conway Castle, under a promise of safe conduct by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Arundel, who had quaintly but successfully reappointed himself as Archbishop. Richard was to be imprisoned by Henry, who still claimed he sought nothing more than the restitution of his lands. He was locked up in the Tower of London, never to be publicly seen again. Bolingbroke appeared with a document purportedly coming from Richard, handing over the crown with astonishingly small reluctance and fulsomely confessing his faults and inadequacies as ruler. This was a document to which only Henry had access. Bolingbroke was crowned Henry IV on October 13, 1399. As for Richard, he was moved out of harm's way to the northern county of Yorkshire, to Pontefract Castle, where it is supposed he died, almost certainly by foul means, by January 1400. And people sort of take this sort of Shakespearean view of Richard that he had must have had these weaknesses, and he was he was a, a weak king, and he, he he was bound to he was doomed to failure. But it's not true at all. When you actually look at the reign, and you get away from the propaganda that was spun spun by Henry the Fourth, um, you see that he was very very skillful in the way he actually uh, took over power in 1397, um, and it. it, it in, in 1399, there was no hint that he would actually be de demoted. And it was only just, uh, uh, it was only by the skin of his teeth that Henry IV, uh, along with Archbishop Arundel, managed to grab power. Uh, and it was certainly not a foregone conclusion at all. And after he, after he took over power, the, there was still a large body of people who uh, hated Henry IV and hated what had happened to the country and were trying to get Richard uh, back on the, uh, on the throne, which is why eventually Henry IV, of course, has him murdered. 1400 is the same year in which the memorial in Westminster Abbey tells us that Chaucer died on October the 25th. Chaucer was in fact buried in the south transept with little or nothing to mark the spot. The tomb that we see as memorial was erected in the reign of Queen Mary, the half-sister of Queen Elizabeth and who preceded her on the throne. It's placed there in 1566 by Nicholas Brigham, who was the secretary of the Queen 
So why suddenly put up this monument more than a century and a half after the death of the poet? According to Terry Jones, the motive for the memorial was religious politics. Chaucer had been promoted as a forerunner of Protestantism. He was regarded as a friend of the Lollards who wrote in the English tongue. Works were being ascribed to him that fitted nicely with this theory, although these have since been excluded from the canon. In keeping with the counter-reformation she was instituting, the Catholic Queen Mary wished to bring Chaucer plainly back to the fold of the Roman Church, and how better than by raising a splendid monument to him within the Abbey, which had also been returned to Catholicism. The date provided by the monument of October the 25th has been contested. It is possible that he died late in 1402. The last record we have of Chaucer comes from a lease of 53 years taken out on a tenement house in the garden of the Lady Chapel of Westminster Abbey. The date is December the 24th, 1399. Like other churches, Westminster offered the right of sanctuary, providing a place of refuge from prosecution. Anyone who violated that right would be automatically excommunicated by the church. Westminster held a particularly privileged position for those seeking shelter in that its rights were specifically granted by a charter of the Saint King Edward the Confessor that extended the right of protection beyond the Abbey Church to its grounds. In fact, over the centuries, the right had been so used and abused that by the time that Chaucer took out a lease, Westminster was harboring a thieves kitchen of rogues who would seek shelter in its grounds by day only to venture out during the hours of darkness to carry on their trade. It is not by chance that one of the streets bordering the abbey walls carried the name of Thieving Lane. Henry has now got power. Arundel's there with him. Uh, the, Richard is in prison in Pontefract. Um, the, there's, uh, the, 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 it seems like the game's up, uh, but there are still people who are trying to get Richard back in. Now there's a meeting, uh, and it's at this point, which is quite interesting, that that Rich, that, Hen, uh, that Chaucer um, takes up lodgings, which are given to him in the Palace of Westminster, which was then uh, or Westminster Abbey rather, um, which was uh, then uh, it was a place of sanctuary actually, and, and they were given given to Chaucer. So it could be that he was seeking sanctuary. We don't really know, um, but it's. Kind of interesting that he did choose to move into the into the place that was seems to be the hotbed of Ricardian sympathy and uh, support and action against uh, against the usurper. Um, how much use would uh, this have been to Chaucer? Well, Arundel didn't give a damn about sanctuary. Um, he uh, there's another there's a, a court case where he he, he goes in and. It, Gets out these uh, these guys out, drags them out of Westminster Abbey, <coughs> um, uh, uh, and just dis disregards sanctuary at all. So I'm I'm sure in the end, Aaron, it wouldn't have been much protection for for Chaucer, but at least maybe it was uh, you could be with uh, the like minds who wanted Richard to come back. Maybe that's why he moved in there. Although on coming to the throne, Henry confirmed all the grants awarded Chaucer by Richard and added a £40 annuity of his own, whether these were actually paid is unknown. If a writer's output has anything to do with the circumstances of his life, the last work of any importance we have from the poet is The Complaint of Chaucer to His Purse, in which he instructs it humorously but repeatedly, Beth heavy again, or else moot I die, otherwise... Be heavy again, or else I must die. Perhaps a grim earnestness underlay the humour. Despite being a son of Gaunt, Chaucer's patron, Henry was closely allied with Thomas Arundel, who had become a kind of power behind the throne. He may well frown on the grants being paid to a man who had presumed to mock the church, whatever had been promised. In that case, Chaucer's fear of a pauper's death would not be a poetical conceit, but terrifyingly real. The anonymous biographer who puts Chaucer's date as 1402 has this to say about him, that he was a man suspected to be spotted with the rebellion of Jack Straw and Wat Tyler. <laughs>
whereas Richard, whilst not involving himself in church politics, was reluctant to use the death penalty, Henry IV had no such scruples. Henry IV comes into power and he is, you know, he is uh, the archetypal tyrant in the Aristotelian sense, that he's only acting in his own interests. Everything he does is for his own, uh, 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 own interests and for his own holding on to power. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I mean, I'm sure, I, I suspect Henry was probably very much like uh, George Bush um, uh, Junior. He, he, he was just an easygoing guy who just sort of, whose dad had been, was a very famous, powerful man. And he gets into power. He's got Dick Cheney on his, on his, on his, over his shoulder in the form of Arundel, uh, pushing him and, and telling him what to do. And he's just, oh, I'll do that. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, uh, but I think in the end, he's acting as a tyrant. A newly enfranchised Arundel began to mould an inquisitional state to his own beliefs and requirements. It was clear that it would only cause further damage to the church were they to prosecute the church's critics for condemning the wealth of the clergy or for encouraging the translation of religious text into English. Instead, they targeted one aspect of Wycliffe's teaching, which they held to be clear heresy. This was Wycliffe's rejection of the doctrine of transubstantiation, which was the dogma that in the ceremony of the Mass, the bread and wine was literally changed into the body and blood of Christ. That means the church held that the bread literally turned into human flesh and wine to human blood, not spiritually or figuratively. If your senses of reason told you otherwise, they lied. Wycliffe and his followers found the teaching impossible to accept. The work of forcing recantations from the heretics had been begun by Arundel's predecessor, Courtney the former Archbishop of Canterbury, who had been forced to back down before John of Gaunt in his efforts to cross-examine Wycliffe. Wycliffe had died in 1384, but there were others of like mind. Nicholas Hereford had been one of the main translators of the Bible. Despite having already humiliated Hereford and others by insisting that full public confessions be made, Arundel was not entirely happy with the form it had taken. Hereford was imprisoned in the Archbishop's castle at Saltwood, near to Canterbury, where it was said he was grievously tormented. On his release, he was required to recant at St Paul's Cross, a particularly poignant location on account of the number of Wycliffeite sermons that had been preached there. Arundel was to add a major incentive to simple torture, the stake. For the first time in the history of the British Isles, a man was to be burned alive for his religious beliefs. In 1401, Henry IV, encouraged by Arundel, had brought in the Statute of Heresy, which authorised the clergy to arrest and try suspects, and in the last instance, to turn them over to the civil authorities for burning. And in 1402, William Sawtree, was put to the stake for refusing to acknowledge the proposition that bread could be turned into flesh. Within days, John Purvey, Wycliffe's spiritual heir who had withstood years of suffering in prison, was to recant at St Paul's Cross. After him, according to one of the chronicles, after the terrible example of Sawtree, many were led to follow Purvey's example. We have two possible dates for the death of Chaucer, one in 1400 and one in 1402. The poet had complained of his funds drying up, buys a lease inside Westminster Sanctuary, and then disappears from history. Might he have disappeared by way of Saltwood Castle when he was jailed and tortured? In fact, it would have been possible for Arundel to engineer this at either date, where his powers would have been considerably greater by 1402 and his net accordingly wider. Then why bury Chaucer in the Abbey at all? There was a lot of waste land where a body would lie unmolested indefinitely, 
The answer would be that the disappearance of the nation's greatest poet would be bound to arouse attention and not the kind that even a dictatorial regime would welcome. Whenever Chaucer died, there would be good reason for seeing his body laid to rest in 1402, for on November the 5th of that year, his son Thomas Chaucer was appointed coroner for the City of London. And it would have been embarrassing for all concerned should an investigation be called for. The age that formed Chaucer had come to an end. The flowering of English literature that had sprouted in the age of Edward III and had been actively encouraged by Richard II had withered away. Nothing was to be seen again on its scale of magnificence with not just the works of Chaucer but those of the poet of Sir Gawain, Langlands, Piers Plowman and John Gower until the Elizabethan age. What was happening in the 14th century was that you'd had a revolution in the, in the court culture throughout Europe. Um, the courts had uh, slightly drifted away from being purely militaristic organisations and they'd become much more uh, conscious of artistic and cultural uh, uh, phenomena. And um, they were, therefore, fashion was very important, art was becoming very important, literature was becoming very important. And each uh, prince or ruler in, in, throughout Europe was realizing that they, uh, there was an intellectual territory which they had to establish as well as uh, a physical geographical territory that they had to establish. And if it, to establish that, you had to have a body of literature uh, and, and science uh, written down in the uh, demotic, in the, in the spoken language of that country. So in the France you've got, uh, uh, <coughs> you've, got Mouch, um, you've got Deschamps uh, and uh, Machau writing in French. Um, you've got, uh, in Italy, you've got um, uh, Boccaccio writing in, in Italian, in, in Tuscan, Dante starting the movement uh, for the demotic. Um, and in England too, you, you, you've got Chaucer and you've got flowering of, of, of writing in English. Um, not with all writers, Chaucer purely writes in English. By the time that Elizabeth came to the throne, the destructive flames that had been lit by the merciless Parliament would have exhausted themselves on lack of fuel. It is true that on the continent a golden age had also come to an end with the death of Boccaccio, but in Europe the Renaissance was being born, which would make that age renowned for the impetus it gave to a new freedom of thought. England, on the other hand, was left in the grip of a king whose interest in culture was negligible and who was prepared to leave such matters in the hands of a man whose every instinct turned towards repression. In 1409, he would bring in a constitution with censorship as his main thrust. Wycliffe's work, of course, was to be forbidden, but any book to be studied must first be approved by a panel of selected orthodox theologians. Each student's way of thinking was to be examined on a monthly basis, and the clergy were only to criticise church matters within clerical confines. Should anyone feel that he was free to speak as they pleased, he should note that all preachers would need to apply for a licence. Chaucer could write it. 